Okay, so let's just recall. So, so we had sigma p, a s-pointed curve. So, so p are s many smooth points in sigma. Sigma I'm uh, only assuming it to be reduced with uh, 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 nodal singularity at most, uh, at most, and fixed level. Which is a positivity. And now we take a bunch of uh, so they are all in uh, so these are all uh, dominant integral weights for the affine D algebra at central charge C. So, so then we define this H lambda was H lambda one, H lambda S. So DC, just to recall, that DC is set of all those lambda in the finite Cartan dual, such that lambda of alpha I check in Z non-negative, and lambda of theta check H at most C. Uh, so these are the simple roots, alpha I check are the simple co-roots. Uh, of the finite G, not the affine G. And last time we saw that uh, this DC parameterizes exactly uh, the uh, integrable highest weight module for the affine algebra with central charge C. So now, so we had this uh, uh, our space of uh, co work. So V of sigma and the notation was P and lambda. So that was H lambda divided by G of sigma minus P optimal H lambda. So, so this is the space of co work. And what we saw last time, so there were two theorems we proved last time that V sigma it does not depend upon the local parameters. And two, we proved that this is finite dimensional. So those were the two main results we proved last time. So today, uh, so I want to prove two theorems. So propagation of network. One and factorization theorem. And if time permits, I will go to the, the uh, uh, projectively flight connection, uh, flight projective connection. So let me state this theorem more precisely. So, so sigma of p is a s pointed curve. And let q, qn, qa be distinct, smooth points and distinct from. So let lambda 
B tends to P. And mu, which is mu one mu a, be attached to q. Then, so we have. So uh, I will need to introduce one more notation. But anyway, let me write this. H lambda is the mu, and I'm going to take the co-invariance with respect to sigma minus p one u. That's isomorphic with v of sigma p q and lambda. Okay, so where? V mu is nothing but V of mu one, V minus sorry, and so uh, for so V omega i are irreducible for the finite G. So I have to still tell you one more thing here. Okay, so 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 yeah, so let, let me say one more thing and then I will explain what this meaning is. So so we have is a module for g of sigma minus p under evaluation. Right. Uh, QI. Let me put QJ respectively. So this means that if I take V1 tensor VA and I take X tensor equation F, so this will be V1. In the VJ factor, I will have F and qj Oops. this will act on vj and okay so here x is in g f is in c of sigma times p and VJ is V VJ. Okay, so so let's go over the statement of this uh, this theorem. So I'm taking the uh, the original H lambda, and I'm tensoring with this finite dimensional representation of G, and I'm taking co-invariant with respect to this one, just P, no Q here. Now this space is isomorphic with this uh, a kind of, uh, space of covacua. Now I'm taking PQ. So now it's a S plus A pointed curve. And I attach the lambda success. So the mu have to be restricted in the sense. Yes. The mu still have to be restricted in the That's right. Case. Exactly. The left hand side is defined whether or not. Absolutely. Uh, yes. But, okay. Absolutely. You are absolutely right. Uh, right. Ah, okay, so they're right. So you are absolutely right. Okay. Because then only this side will make sense. Unless you restrict that this side does not make sense. Okay, so that's this statement. Ah. Now this isomorphism. Let me let me. Yeah. So first, let me say how this isomorphism is uh, obtained, and then we will go uh, over the the main main points of the proof. 
So, so, uh, so let me. So, uh, okay. Anyway, so that's not. Now, there is a canonical inclusion here. Because view mu j sits inside h of mu j as the top level piece there. So, so, the, so there's a canonical inclusion. Now, only thing we want to make sure that this inclusion is g of sigma minus p equivariant, or a module math. So this is. Uh, G of sigma minus P. Now here, so one should observe that sigma minus P, of course, in each rather. So this gives me G of sigma minus P to G of sigma minus P union Q. So see this side is a module for this one, and this side is a module for this one. So I'm going to view this side as also a module for this one via this one. That's how I'm going to view it. And now the claim is, that this is G of sigma minus P module map. And the only thing we need to observe that any positive power of T, see, because we are going to take local parameter at this QJ, and any positive power of the local parameter TJ at those points is going to kill this space. That's the only thing we need to observe. So, so, so the way, I mean, this, this is going to act here, H, we are going to take local parameter at QJ, uh, and, uh, and the local parameter, and this one is being acted by just the evaluation. So any positive power, because this is the highest weight space, highest weight G module space in H mu, so this is going to kill that. So, so this, is, uh, this becomes a G of sigma minus P module. So now, so at least there's a map now because I'm taking this is space. So I'm taking this is space and modding out by this action. So this is a, uh, this map which I gave is G of sigma minus P module map. So this is going to go there. So definitely now we have a map. So uh, now the question is, is this map nice? So, so, question is this map? I mean, it's not a question because I'm putting it as a theorem. So, it's not a question. So, I'm going to prove that this is an isomorphic. Okay, so some reduction here. So, So let's take, I'm going to call H as H lambda and tensor V of mu one and so on. I'm just going to take one less. And what one is going to prove by induction is that H tensor V of mu A and then I take the covariant with respect to G of sigma minus P. And this is isomorphic with now H tensor H uh, And this one is G of sigma minus just this point Q. Right. 
So let's go over that. So I'm saying by induction, it suffices to prove. So rather than taking a many factors, I, I, I can take just one factor by absorbing everything else in my H. So, so now I took H to be this one. And now we need to prove that H tensor B of mu A with respect to the same one co-invariant. And here I take H tensor H of just one, uh, yeah, just one factor at this point. And for notation, I'm just going to put mu A equals mu and Q A equals Q. And yeah, just not to repeat it. Sigma. Yes. On the right hand side, it's sigma naught minus QA, right? You won't eliminate the P. Uh, absolutely, you are so right. Absolutely, so sigma. That's right. Exactly. Thanks. So that's what we want to prove. So so what we are going to prove first is that, so, so first we will prove the result for H mu A replaced by corresponding Burma model. generalized Verma module. And this notation was M at uh, V mu and the central charge. And let me just, I mean, uh, just recall this definition. So this is by U of G hat and U of G power C H T C C and then we take the lambda. So this is the generalized Verma module. I mean the parabolic Verma module. So I'm taking U of G hat and U G of power C H T and the central charge. And the central charge on this one is going to act by small c. So my capital C and the small c don't look too different. So that, that's going to act by small c. And gt is going to act by evaluation at t equals 0. So, so g power series t is going to act on v mu uh, by evaluation at t equals 0. And this is the, the v mu is the g module. So that's how it acts. OK. so so. Replaced by means now V mu A or V mu it is still sitting inside here as the top piece. So it's still sitting here. So this map which I defined makes perfectly good sense if I replace my H by the generalized Verma model. So what we are going to prove now is that H tensor V of mu A G of sigma minus P is isomorphic with H tensor Verma module M at V U C and then you take G sigma minus Q. So far, so good. Anybody in? That's what I'm going to prove now. Right. So, so let's choose a parameter. Z 
at Q such that uh, the inverse belongs to C of sigma naught minus Q. Okay, so I'm choosing a parameter z for the curve at q such that the inverse of z is really a, a global function on sigma naught minus q. And this is achieved because I'm assuming that every useful component of sigma has at least one point pi. So sigma naught is an affine curve. Yes. That, so what is important to, to note here that since sigma naught is an affine curve, I can make such a choice. I can, I can pick a global function here, such that uh, this function, the inverse of that uh, works as a local parameter at Q. Okay. Do you all agree? Okay, so then G of sigma naught minus Q, I can write it as G of sigma naught with epsilon. G hat minus where G hat minus is nothing but G tensor. Uh, so Z is must C. Uh, please say it again. Uh, yeah, so Z was. So that's what I've written. Maybe my, my writing is not. Inverse. Is that what you mean? Yes, uh, I don't see why inverse. Uh, okay. Uh, why it should be inverse? So C has a pole at Q, no, no, sorry, Z does not have a pole at Q. See, Z is a local parameter at Q. But you want Z not to have zero poles. Uh, so Z, so, So Z is a local parameter at Q, and I'm saying that Z inverse should be a global function on this one. And you are saying that even Z can be here? I don't see why you can do that. Okay. Uh, okay. So. Okay. So. Uh, For the inverse. You want a simple pool at Q. That's right. And uh, also. Yes. So at Q, I want a simple pool. That's exactly what I want. And you should, because this is a fine thing. So sigma naught is a fine, and I want a simple pool at Q. So I just take a function, which is, and once it's a simple pool, if I take its inverse, it will become a, a, a parameter. That's all I want. Do you agree? Oh, so Z can have some Z holes, uh, whatever it wants. Yeah, exactly. I, 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 yeah. I mean, I don't care what Z is outside a small neighborhood. I don't care about that. But I'm saying that I'm going to pick first a function here which is globally defined, globally means here, and it has a simple pole at Q, and then I'm just calling it Z inverse, and then I take the inverse of that, that will become a, a local parameter, that's all I'm saying. Right? And then I'm saying that if I take the functions here, then this will be exactly of this type. Yes. Okay. Anybody, any, any, any question? I see some 
the skeptic face and so <laughs> So just to repeat what Pierre said, that I'm taking a global function as sigma naught minus q, which has a simple pole at q. And since sigma naught is affine, I can make such a choice. Uh, and then I'm, so I'm just calling this function c inverse. If you don't like it, let's just call it f here. And then I'm going to take f inverse just as a local parameter q. But I mean, just for my notational sake, because after all, I have to interact with the affine algebra, so I would rather call it z first, and I would rather call it z. That's all I do. Okay, so this becomes this. Now let's define a new algebra, which is g of sigma naught minus q, and I'll take the central charge c. Okay, so, so then, so this tells us that H H S mod. And, and see, I'm only removing Q from here, and this H does not have the last one. So the H stops at the one below, so Q uh, is not involved in the uh, evaluation here. So this does become a S mod. And this S embeds in G hat by C going to C and XF going to XFQ. Sorry. So I'm embedding this Lie algebra. I'm basically, not, not basically, exactly. I'm embedding this Lie algebra at the point Q. So I, with, with respect to this local parameter, I chose Z at Q. So with this local parameter, I'm embedding S in G at. So C will go to C and XF will go. Now this notation I, I use often, that just means extensor. So this is going to go to X of F will go to X of F true. So this is the, 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 the Laura expansion of F at Q. Okay. Right. So let's now, I'm going to write certain. All right, so okay, so now I'm going to focus on the the uh, the right side of this equation, this side. No, sorry, this side. <laughs> so H tells M hat C and I'm going to take covariant with respect to G of C. And I want to say. This is isomorphic H tensor and height zero C. <coughs> okay, right. So the only difference, yes. So okay. So so far, what have I done? 
So I took G of sigma minus Q. I am taking co-invariant with respect to this Lie algebra. And S has only one other factor, C there. But C is acting trivially here. So C acts trivially here. Right. So since C acts trivially. Sorry, I think Jeff. Uh, just give me one minute, please. Okay. Say it again. Can you say this argument where, where is, the, is the Virasoro algebra somehow secretly not so far involved in this? Not so far. But will it will it be? It, it maybe it's not explained. No. Words. Okay. At least I don't see Virasoro right yeah. now. Yeah. But when we do the connection. Then Vira Solo will be will be more than clearly present. Okay. At least not so. I, at least I don't see Vira Solo so far. Okay. If you see, maybe maybe it will be some other proof. Well, uh, you know, the right hand side of this is, is indexing some kind of observables on, on, on the curve, which are at both P and Q. And, and I sort of told exactly. you the, the nature of the argument is you move the points in Q right. to be part of P. Exactly. But but moving the points yes. involves some kind of Virasoro, the easy part of Virasoro also, right? I, I'm just trying to understand if that's what's going on with this proof work. It's quite possible, but... Uh... Uh, at least explicitly, I'm not using okay. Virasoro. Okay. Maybe there's a different proof which okay. may be even better. I don't know that. Uh, but uh, okay. So huh. now, C acts trivially on this. Actually, I should have said that. Right. So C, C is acting by the capital C is acting by C here, but it's acting by minus C here because this is stationed at Q and I'm taking the, 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 the complement set. So actually the, the, the capital C is acting by minus C here and plus C here. So, so the effect is that uh, capital C is acting by zero here. So it, it's not acting. So this thing, I mean, S differs from this set only by capital C. So these two co-invariants are the same. So, and now uh, let's okay. So actually, I, I want to remove this because I want to write this. Now, this side. By definition, each edge tensor U of S and M hat V nu C. This is isomorphic with edge tensor U of G sigma naught V nu. See, because S has G of sigma naught minus Q, which is same thing as G of sigma naught plus G minus N. So I'm saying that, uh, so this object is same as, uh, because after this is free under G minus N. This thing is free. So, so I could actually, maybe I should have done that in two steps. But as long as it's clear to you, I will, I will. So you see, so M hat is free under G minus hat. So this, okay, maybe it's better to do it in two steps. And S, I write it as G of sigma naught. So G of sigma naught plus G minus plus C, C. 
And this is by definition, G minus head S minus head. So by definition, I mean, M height by definition, if you have G minus height, then start with P mu over complex numbers. And I just rewrote what SH. Okay. Now, this stage, now this is it's U of G minus height here, and this is G minus height. I can cancel this and I will get H tensor U of G of sigma naught. No, sorry, just CC. And we get But taking this one, I mean, having C because C is acting non trivial. Same thing as this one. Because C is acting non trivial, so it's, it's not going to contribute anything to the going variant. So we got that, and I think that's what we needed. So if I go through all this isomorphism, I get, so this was the right-hand side of the equation, H tensor M height V mu C, G of sigma naught minus Q. And here we got H tensor V mu, U of G sigma naught, which is exactly this side. So in this case, I mean, for the, the generalized Burma module, we have proved it. Now let's see what we, but uh, we wanted to prove it for the integrable module. So, So now we have proved this, but let's look at the sequence M height V mu C to H mu. I mean, C I'm suppressing in any case, and there will be some kernel. And in fact, this kernel is very explicit. It's generated by a single element. So, okay. So, <laughs> so what we need to prove that this, uh, right. So what we need to prove that this kernel does not contribute anything to the coin value. So, uh, right. So now I am going to, so let's, so this is an exact sequence. Now H tensor K. Okay, so now I'm going to take coil variant here. So we will have a sequence. With respect to G sigma minus Q. <laughs> so we will have that. And now, what one wants to prove that if I take anything here, it will go to uh, zero here. That's what we want to prove. That if I take anything here, it will go to zero here. No, no, sorry, no, sorry. Intermediate. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> of course. Of course it will go to zero, <laughs> that's triviality, but it will go to zero here. Now this calculation is a bit, I mean, it's not too long, but it's, it's a boring calculation, which I don't want to do it on the board. I mean, it's uh, some 
SN2 theory we have to we have to use some SN2 theory, but it's a it's a I mean two page boring calculation. So uh, I will give you a reference. There's one new statistics case. It serves the question of a Fermat model. <laughs> There's one new statistical analysis itself for growth and of a bad uh, it Yes, it, 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 it is. That's right. That's right. It is a quotient of a bad model. In fact, it has a single relation. And I will tell you what the relation is. It's E theta tensor with uh, uh, T to the power, the highest weight. So mu of theta check, something like that. So it's a very explicit, it's generated by a single element, it's very explicit. And you use that and you use some SL2 theory, but it, it's a long calculation, which... What are you going to use about H? Uh, no, uh, I am saying that K part, so K part is generated by, a, see, see the kernel, this K is generated by a single element. Uh, and the generator is something like that. In fact, I can tell you very exactly. So let's see. <clears throat> that is very explicit. But the argument that uh, then, then when you tensor with H, you get this isomorphism on homology, is that going to be something that works for any H? Or are you going to use the fact that H was? That particular yeah, no, it works for that edge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It works for that edge. Uh, yes. So, so in fact, I wrote it more or less correctly, uh, except that more or less. And then it is C minus mu theta check plus. What is special about representations of that form? You mean this one? Yeah. It's the integrable module. If there's integral module, like, for what? So, you see, this piece is an integrable module for G height. And this piece also, I mean, it's, I mean, it's also integrable for G height. But which, what do you mean by G height? Then this one. Are you taking that? So I am taking at the point QI. Uh -huh. See, so see, this is the action. So the actual extents are affecting on this piece is by evaluation at QJ. So this is the evaluation module. All right, so that's not a representation of G, right? It's only a re representation of, of the. It's the representation of G of sigma minus P, right? That's right. That's right. Exactly. So everything I'm going to view it as a representation of G of sigma minus P. So this whole thing is a representation of G of sigma minus P. No, not of G height. No, definitely not. So you're, you're saying something about you take a, a local parameter at the, the point that you're working on okay. and it has some integrability Right. Articulate exactly. That's right. That's right. See the okay. I will. Since you are curious, I have not reviewed the proof right now, and so this is Are you giving the reference? Yes, yes, yes. That's right. That's right. So, so you see, first, so basically, you have to prove So, 
Okay, so, so, so the basic idea of the proof is the following, that so ah. Okay, I, I, I mean, so this algebra S, which I define, this maps surjectively onto G hat and G hat plus. So G hat plus, let's see, very, very, so G hat minus I defined, oh, it has, oh, so G hat plus is only with respect to the parameter uh, Z. So this is nothing but G tensor Z C Z. And no, that's, that's not the one to understand. Uh, I said. This one does not depend on the parameter. This one? Yes. Yes, that's right. Okay. Exactly. So this is G tensor C of the, uh, the uh, corresponding formal disk at that point. But the parameter gives a nice supplement. Exactly. exactly. In the calculation, I, I'm going to use. But you are absolutely right. OK, so this is a surjective map. So that means that I can write S H G hat. No, no, sorry. So I can, yeah, so S plus. No, G hat, sorry, other way around. So G hat, I can write it as S plus not direct sum. Okay. So now the U G hat is span is going to be by the 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 P -B -W theorem. So if I uh, so in U G hat any element, I can write it as a span of y one through y m, x one through x n, and I am going to take all these y i to be in S and x j to be in uh, in G hat plus. I'm just using the PPW here. And what one proves is the following, that if I take H tensor, X1, Xn, and then I am going to take Y, To the power n mu and act on the highest weight vector, it is zero, where y is nothing but exactly what I wrote, e theta z plus. So this is one thing one wants to prove. So, so let's call this map I. This map I'm going to call I. So this map. So let's just call this map I. Okay. Now what one is claiming that I of this one is zero for any H in H. Okay, right. So I take any H in H and I take this one. So X1, Xn is arbitrary element in S. Uh, yes, arbitrary element in S. And see this K, was generated by a single element, and this was exactly e theta tensor z worst. 
to the power n mu, this was uh, the uh, c minus mu theta checklist. I'm just calling it n mu. So that's what I, I did. So, that, so any element I can write it like that. And the point is that this i of this element is gets killed. And that's the main thing. And once you have that, right. So and still you have to, to, to do some more argument. So anyway, so <laughs> I don't want to. Can you give to her? Yes, yes. Oh, God, absolutely. So, so reference. It's a uh, uh, page uh, uh, proof of theorem. Two point two point two uh, in my Berlin book. And there, so I gave the first part of the proof from, from this, but the, the next part, which I'm not, I mean it's it's a two and a half page calculation. So 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 maybe what Akshay said, maybe there is some some Ira Soro there, which is playing some role, but I, I don't know at which half. There is definitely some SLTU theory which is being used here, some computational relation there. Uh, but uh, uh, but Vira Soro's role, I don't see it directly at least. Yeah. No, I still want yes. to present more. Will you have that if you take a mu which is not good, which is uh, not in DC? Yeah. Will it be true that if you take the corresponding verma and do the same coin variant, you will get a zero? And also, if you take oh 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 oh, I see, I see. So you are saying that that instead of the last one, yes. I took one of the intermediary one. Is that what you're saying? Something which is a new, which is yes, <laughs> right. Would I get zero? And same for verba. But see, the problem will be this will not even be a module. You see, because so suppose. This this thing, this mu is sitting at some point, which is a pole here. So I won't be able to even define this this module, right? No, no, no. I want the Q to be a nice place, but I want mu to be bad. Oh, oh, oh! I see. Okay, okay. So you still want this thing to be at Q? Yes. Ah, okay, okay. But I want it not to be an admissible uh, weight. Ah, now I, now I fully understand your question. So you don't want mu to be in DC. So it's not a dominant weight for the affine, but just a dominant weight for, ah. Uh, do I know an answer? Uh, I was wondering whether your proof was giving such you in this case a goof and of a verma. Yes, a right. Weight, which is not dominant. That's right. That's right. So, yeah, right. So, I think what will happen. Although I'm not hundred percent certain, what will happen? See, this is the zero cohomology or homology. Now, if I take mu to be not dominant for the affine, so zero cohomology will vanish, but it will show up in higher homology, and it will show up exactly. So you take the fundamental L curve and you move to mu, and the smallest affine value group which it needs to take to there. So in that degree, so here it will just be an H one. Yeah, right. Here it will be exactly. I mean, it, it can be higher H one. Yes, yes, but for the K U F. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. That's right. Exactly. That's right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Here it will be exactly. That's right. That's right. Indeed, indeed. That's absolutely right. Yeah. I think it's the same thing that happens in the Borel Bay bar. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. That's right. 
So, so in fact, you had asked this question, right? Did you ask this question? Oh, the higher amount. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, and I suppose I did not answer that question that time. Sent me an email. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. I sent you an email. So, I mean, just for everybody else. So, if I take everything dominant in the affine uh, 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 case, then there is no higher HI. Uh, there is no higher uh, homology. But if I take something, so, right. <laughs> So we can ask if I take lambda one, no, uh, what do I mean by that? So that's not what your email said. Your email said there was higher homology. Yeah, 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 that's right, that's right. If, no, no, one minute, one minute. I'm a bit confused now. I'm a bit confused now. So, Okay. Okay. <laughs> so I have to formulate the question more correctly. And then, but in this case, if I take everything to be in the dominant chamber for the affine wide loop, then I think there is no higher homology. Yes, so in this definition of yeah. the yeah. is a going, uh, yeah. yes, that's right. That should not be nothing. That's what I, I think, uh, unless I'm interpreting something wrong. But, but only, so, so see, I have to formulate this homology question correctly. But in this case, I think there is no higher homology. I thought what your email was saying was, uh, that it was analogous to the, the finite dimensional situation. If you complete, right. if you look at the category of finite dimensional Correct. representations, it's semi-simple. But if you look at all the algebra representations. That's right, that's right. So I have to, okay. I will have to look at this result again, but my uh, I mean, feeling is that I have to formulate the question a little bit differently. And the way to, uh, I actually, uh, Pierre said that we can ask, so let's take some bunch of H, but let's do it with the evaluation model. Okay. And I'm going to take with the same G homology for G uh, sigma minus P. Okay. I think I can state the result I think more or less correct. And at least I think that's what I sent you, unless I sent you something <laughs> total garbage. So let's take this. And this H lambda is still uh, integrable, uh, uh, tensor product of integrable modules for the uh, uh, fun case. But then I am tensoring with a bunch of evaluation modules, but these need not be in the dominant chamber for the affine wild group. So mu i may not be in the dominant, exactly what we are asked. They may, uh, then I'm saying that if I take all of them to be in the dominant chamber for the affine wild group, there's only H zero, there's nothing else. But if I take arbitrary mu i, then it exists exactly in one degree H i, where i is, uh, so, so, I'm just going to write L of mu one and L of mu s. And what is L of mu one, L of mu s? Is the smallest affine wild group element which brings mu i to the dominant chamber for the affine, affine, uh, uh, I mean, uh, affine uh, wild group. 
And I mean, then the rows shift. I'm, I'm a little bit, I'm, I'm, I'm not, uh, there is generally, a, uh, even in the, uh, the Borel Well part theorem, there is a row shift. I'm, I'm kind of uh, glossing over that point. So the result is that this is non-zero exactly in this degree and it's zero elsewhere. So that is the result. If I remember the result correctly, but I sent you something different. I think this is not what you're saying here. Or like, forget the, um, the second part, but just, okay. just the, the A. Okay. The part with the H. Okay. You're saying that you should expect um, the existence of some, some higher homology having to do with the topology of the loop group. I will have to look at my email if you don't mind. I will I have to look at, maybe I'm thinking of something slightly different when I, 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 I so anyway, I, I will fix this and I will, but I think this result which I state, I think is correct. I think so. And if it is correct, can we have a little proof somewhere? Yes. And I will, send you the reference, precise reference next time. I mean, not next time, sometime today. I have two questions. Of course. So I'd like to think about this statement geometrically. Very good. All right. Yeah. So can I do it by, you know, saying both sides are computing. Yeah. I look at moduli G bundles and I look at the vector bundle there associated by taking the tensor property <laughs> lambdas and mu's. <laughs> And what you're doing on either side is you're uniformizing in two different ways, but uh, one at sigma minus p, one at sigma minus p minus q, but they're both computing that. Okay, so, so at least let me say what I understand. So this side is definitely, uh, so, so it's the parabolic moduli space of G bundles. And you are going to have some, some natural line bundles there. And the global section is exactly this side. This side. So when you say parabolic moduli space, yes. you mean you're looking at G bundles with some extra structure and at those points. At those points. So I I, I do, those mark points, I'm looking at extra the parabolic structure there. So could you tell us what this is uh, uh, in terms of moduli of G bundles, what, yes. what, what this common vector space describes? You mean this one? Yeah, 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 yeah. But, so this one is exactly, so in fact, let's take the simplest possible case. I have one point and I attach the weight zero, simplest. So then I take moduli space of G bundles, okay? And there, so the moduli space of G bundle has Picard group Z. And there, there is a, depending upon the C, the central chart, there is a specific line bundle yes. whose global section is canonically isomorphic with this space. Yes. Okay. Now, so that's the picture when there are no, there is only one point and it's uh, cent, uh, only central chart lambda I zero. Yeah. But if I take these different lambda I and several points, then I just take model I space, a parabolic bundle, parabolic structure at those points, and these lambda i's will give you a parabolic structure, or what is called the quasi-parabolic structure. So is that the same as um, like you, uh, using these mu i's to define some vector bundle on one g and taking- That's right, exactly, okay. exactly, that's right, exactly. So you can view like that, okay. So you see, what is parabolic model i space? At those points, you are basically giving a parabolic structure. And now these lambda i will give rise to vector bundles. I mean, V lambda i will give rise to vector bundles. And then you take the global section of that, that, uh, that uh, uh, vector bundle. But sorry, I guess my, do I have to look at the parabolic moduli space or can I just look at bungee with some? Uh, yes. It's probably the same, right? Okay, yes. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So, so, Okay, so these two sides are two ways of uniformizing bungee. Well, well one you, so to speak, on the left, you've- Correct, exactly. Uniforms outside. Exactly. Okay. Fantastic, okay. it's absolutely right. 
And then my second question is. Yes. Think no, no, one minute. No. But, but actually, so that's how this proof can be done geometrically. Okay. But if you are asking, can you put in the Verma module? I don't know. Okay. Because see, Verma module, the global section is only given by D module. So it's not a locally free sheet. Yeah. Okay, second question. Is related to Jacob's question. Now, okay. if you ask about the higher homology, right. will that be related to the um, higher cohomology of that line bundle? Does it have uh, of the bundle on one G or is it not totally unrelated? Right. So higher cohomology is zero. Okay. And uh, yeah, I mean, okay. So this so, so it's not important, but I proved it with uh, another symbol. I see. So this this H I. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, Sorry, but when you say zero, you're talking about the, the thing having to do with bundles, right? That's right. But but I think the the algebra homology is it's something different. different. Uh, yeah. For, and so my question is, what is the geometric interpretation of that? Is there a way to see what that the algebra homology is saying about bungee? Um, so if you are asking if the Lie algebra homology, uh, what does it say yeah. about bungee? Yeah. The higher homology. It's not an important question, just... No, no, it is an important question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but you see... Yeah, I'm... Okay. So uh, when I say the higher cohomology is zero, it's only in the case when we are all in the dominant chamber for yeah. the fine matrix. Yes. I am all uh, uh, there. I see. Now, if you take lambda yeah. or mu not yeah. in the dominant chamber of a fine wire group, then I don't know that. Then I don't know. So, okay. So at least I understand your question. I don't want to say anything which is like totally idiotic. So let me, let me yeah. think about that yeah. question. Yes, Jacob, you have somebody so you can ask this question in the finite dimensional situation, right? Like you, you have a compact Lie group and it has a Lie algebra and you can study uh, the Lie algebra homology, let's say with coefficients in the trivial representation. And then what you get is actually the homology of, um, has to do with the homology of the group as a topological space. Well, one has to be careful, Jacob. It's only true for the compact group. See, if you take a nilpotent group, yeah. It's very different. Yeah. See, if you take a yeah. nilpotent group, for example, yeah. then it's very different. So, for example, this Costan's theorem yeah. on nil homology, I mean, if you take the corresponding unknown. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so there is, there is, there is, yeah. So, anyway, I understand your question and I don't have an immediate answer, but, but I, I think I will be able to tell you something better. Is everyone okay now? Yeah? Okay, good. So let's see. Uh, <laughs> so model of some details, which is <coughs> some of calculation, which uh, I, first of all, I don't even remember right now. And secondly, is probably not very inspiring to go through two and a half figure calculation here. But let's draw a couple of consequences here. Okay, let's see, corollary. So that is, right. So this is more traditional form of propagation of vector. So sigma p is pointed for. So if I take this space of uh, conformal block, sigma, and P lambda, is same thing like P of sigma, you attach one more point, 
and we attach the zero weight there. So this is the more traditional form of the, uh, the propagation of vacua, that you add more points. Of course, you are only allowed to add smooth points. You add more points, but as long as you put weight zero there, but these are not the trivial representation for the finally algebra, this central charge C. So keep that in mind. Uh, so then these two uh, 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 spaces are isomorphic. And, and that comes pretty trivially from here, I suppose. Ah, right. This comes pretty trivially from here because I take one more point, just Q, and and I put weight zero here. So that's the space, this is space. And on this side, I have H lambda and mu is zero for the finite case. So it's one dimensional. So, so this is trivial consequence of the previous theorem. Now, the other consequence, which is quite useful, is that, let's see, I put the right assumption. Huh. So let sigma be irreducible. And then this is space V sigma P lambda is also marked with H zero now at simple charge C and I take V lambda and then I calculate the thing with G of sigma minus this point Q. And sometimes this is a very useful result. So let me say that. So again, sigma P is just pointed, but I'm assuming sigma to be irreducible now. So this is space of conformal block. is same thing I take the, the, this, this uh, whatever, uh, this representation of the uh, finally algebra, central charge C, but highest. But at the point Q. Yeah, so second thing. This, this H is at the point. That, that's right. Oh, that's right. That's right. Indeed. Indeed. That's right. Yes. So this is at the point Q. And I take those finite dimensional representations and I can calculate that. And we will get this. And now let's see how does one go. Ah, so here, so this falls follows from the last theorem by taking a P. I mean, singleton Q, <laughs> lambda zero, Q by P, and mu by lambda, maybe it's by notation. <laughs> so if I do that, then we'll get exactly this result. So for part two, it's important that you have one point where you've put made yeah. something integrable. Right. right. Exactly. Exactly. And you see, that's why I needed this to be irreducible because I want every component to have, uh, I mean, I want sigma minus q to be a fine. And that's why I, I, I put this assumption. Okay. Does it make sense? Okay, so I want to move on to the factorization theorem unless anybody has any question. Okay. Jacob, you have some question? No? Okay, actually, if people want break, I don't mind giving five minutes break. Actually, I'm supposed to give you a 15 minute break, but. <laughs> you ask too many questions. No, no, yeah. <laughs> that's fantastic. I mean, you know, I mean, as I said in the beginning, at the end of it, I'm going to hopefully learn more than you people will learn from my course. So, so, uh, so actually, these are such excellent questions, which which I will have to ponder over. So, so. I have a question during the break. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Break is no, you can ask questions anytime. Yes. 
Okay, but now everyone will stay for the question. Right? Anyway, <laughs> if you, you said you can prove all the higher cohomology of the spongy vanishes. That's right. So does that mean you can prove this Berlinde formula by re using Riemann rock? No. I mean, yes, I know. So see, the trouble is that Riemann rock, it has two components. You have to get the chunk class of the line bundle, first of all. But secondly, you have to get the torque genus of the moduli space. Yeah. I see. So, and then you have to do the cup product. Yeah. So you don't know enough about the homology. Right. So, so there is a paper, I should say that, there is a paper by, um, by uh, Kirwan and uh, her co-author. What's her name? Do you remember? The... So Kirwan and uh, I think she was her student. Kirwan. And anyway, I will probably remember the name. So they did it for SLM. Uh -huh. See, because you you uh, have to have... So and did it means... Did, oh, they proved it. They proved the Berlin name exactly. using uh, Riemann rock. Riemann rock, but you have to know this uh, cohomology <laughs> algebra yes, structure yes, right. very intimately right. of, the, of, of, the, uh, of the thing. And uh, see, in that case, the higher cohomology vanishing... Anyway, that's not... So, um, but it's, it's quite difficult to know exactly the, the, the couple of the structure. Also, keep in mind the moduli space is never smooth. Oh, I mean, it's a technical problem because, because what happens, even though it's not smooth, but... Uh, it's smooth as a stack, but... Yeah, but, correct, but, correct. But, but I that's right. Different. Yeah, it's smooth as a stack. But it's not complex. It's not complex. Yes, right. So, I mean, but you do understand the cohomology of that stack. Yes, but who you the hook? Do you the uh -huh. I mean, my knowledge there is, I shaky. I mean, I don't want to. <laughs> I get totally, I mean. <laughs> so, yeah. So, but I think that's not such a serious problem, even though probably it's a technical problem. Uh, See the often one is more happy when stable is equal to semi stable. No, that's co prime case. Yes, yes. that's co prime, but this is not that case. I think it it's never that case because we are taking the semi simple group. Yes, only for reductive group you can have a co for GLN bundle you can have a co prime case, but for SLN bundle it's always degree zero. You could look at the uh, vector bundle with determinant isomorphic to a given land bundle. It is of the B of the A part. Yeah, correct. I am not, I'm not totally. Uh, yeah, I'm not. So you are saying that if you take vector bundle with a fixed determinant line bundle, yeah, I don't know how, how it, it plays out with, with this whole thing. not the case, you one and the other to look at SLN. I actually, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I don't have very precise knowledge of their work. I mean, I, I, I understand they do this thing for a SLM uh, case, whether they prove the whole Berlin formula or they do it for, I, I really, I really do not. Can, can I, so is the question whether you can get the Berlin, the dimension of these global sections directly? I mean, just, I think there is another. I think rock. there is a recent paper where they don't go through conformal blocks. I, I didn't read it, but I think there is a recent paper where they. I, I'm not aware of that. I can point. try to find it and send it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I see. Okay. I, I think there is one where it's like a direct proof of the Berlin the formula, but I never. Yeah. Also, I should say that uh, this mood, 
and one of the Labori or, or somebody else, Bismuth, maybe Labori. So they had a symplectic geometric proof, but they had lots of restrictions. So the weight has to be very large and, and they have they have restrictions. And I think the problem again is the singularity which really screw up things. So so but again it's a long work, maybe 200 plus pages of thing. And it's funny, have you ever read Verlinde's paper on the Verlinde? It's like it's a couple pages. I have no <laughs> idea what he's saying. <laughs> but it's, it's, not, it's just two or three pages, very short. But at least I the know. argument for it. I know, I know. <laughs> in general, I have great difficulty in understanding any mathematics paper, including his own. I have really never really understood his page paper. <laughs> But it's interesting. He gives some heuristic argument that, yes, I don't right. don't, that I don't understand even at a heuristic level what he's saying, but it's, it's extremely right. succinct. Right, that's right. Okay. Did, you, did I answer your question? Yeah, I did. So shall we do the factorization theorem? Okay. Okay. So, uh, so before I do factorization theorem, let me just uh, do a little bit of a def uh, definition. Uh, so let's take M, a representation of G height, but highest weight module. Right now, I'm not assuming it to be a level, but just the highest weight model. And then I want to define DM, which is, I just said it is M check. So this is a restricted dual. I will explain in a minute. Restricted dual of M. So what it means that it's a subset of M star, the full dual. This is the full dual. But so M is highest weight model, so it decomposes into weight space H. So these are the weight spaces. And then M check, or I can just take the action with respect to the T action. Uh, uh, so T weight, but anyway, I can take that. So M check is by definition M delta star direct sum, not the direct product. So that is what is the uh, restricted one. And now, but we put a different action there. So I'm defining XN and this is, so I take F here. So this is really, a, 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 so this is by definition, X minus N acting usual way on F on the dual space. So, so this XN is nothing but X cancel Z to the power. So this is acting on F by X minus N acting on F. See, the idea is that if I take M to be highest weight module, M check becomes a lowest weight module in the natural way. And by, by flipping this, I still make it the highest weight module. That's the idea. But, uh, so, but in the theory, that's why it is used to parameter. Uh, yes. It is used to throws of the parameter in a serious way. I am not bothered. To if this weight decomposition, really you need to use C double parenthesis T and you cannot change the parameter T. Yeah, I. Right. So, yeah, I guess. But, yeah. Because but effectively, what you really use is more. Uh, if the atom has C double parenthesis T, but you really here want C. The right, exactly. That's right. That's indeed right. That's right. CTT inverse. Yes. Yes. Correct. 
Now, so this is, so this again becomes the highest weight module. And, ah, okay, okay, no. And C acting on F is by minus CF. Again, you see? Right, I mean, otherwise it will not be a real algebra action. Okay, so then what happens that, so if I take D of H lambda, so this becomes H lambda star. Okay, well, so what is lambda star? So, la so lambda star is just the, the minus W naught lambda. So this is for the, so V lambda, and this corresponds to the representation V lambda dual. So this is the highest weight for, so, so lambda star is highest weight for V lambda star. And I'm just giving you the expression. It's minus W naught lambda, W naught being the longest element of the particle. So, okay. and this is very easy to see. I mean, this is not, I mean, I'm not writing something significant. I'm just explaining it to see. Following up on what? Yes, of course. Does this uh, operation have some interpretation in terms of what happens when you, uh, when you do this? V construction for uh, P1, putting one of the points at zero and one of them at infinity. Yeah, right, so, so you switch them. Sorry, can you, you switch them. You switch. Switch them because Z becomes Z inverse. But what's, sorry, could, if I didn't want to get into local coordinates, but I wanted to write down some universal property that this representation had. Okay, I see. So you are asking. Uh, but maybe Homs from another representation into it is given by applying this construction to. No, I, I understand your question. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I don't know, actually, I don't. See, because the way at least I am doing the representation theory, I'm using coordinates, right? <laughs> and uh, once I'm using the coordinate, what I'm doing, that I am taking the inverse of the coordinate. So I am, so on P1, let's say I'm, I'm doing the theory on zero, at zero, with the usual coordinate, then this operation makes it at infinity. See, because jet becomes jet inverse, right? So jet inverse becomes the coordinate system at infinity on P1. Uh -huh. So now whether one can view this intrinsically. I think if you have, uh, when you look at highest weight module, then instead of looking at V uh, tensor C part double parenthesis T, you can think to V tensor C TP inverse only. So there, things make better sense, I would say. You can take the to, to dual in this sense, uh, and you get, as Kumar was saying, from highest way to lowest weight. But then if you extend T and the inverse, then uh, we go back to the highest weight model. Right. Yeah. But have a good trick. Could you describe this object that you make as representing the functor of? Ah. Okay. I. Right. So to answer your question, let's see if. So definitely this is true. 
but this may not be saying much. But you want it for arbitrary. I'm wondering if both of those things have a description as V of P1 with uh, M and H mu at the, so I guess the other way around. Yeah. So V of V. So the P1. Yes. Where you take, um, I guess, M at. Uh, at zero. Wait, sorry. There's yes. A, so, so, should, should, so we switch there. Uh, Com, one of those is. So this is M. Yeah. Okay. So you are going to take it at P one zero at zero. Yeah. Okay. And then. And then put um, you know H mu at infinity. Right. So you are going to put H mu at infinity. And, and dm at zero is same thing as h mu at zero and m. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, something like that. Question. So if you know, right, 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 right. Uh, right, no, that's the. Uh, Yeah, I. Yeah, I. But you see, what I would like, not just the integrable highest bit module half, I would like to have something more general in, in let's say, category O. Uh -huh. So in category O, But you mean that you would like this operation to be defined on a larger class of representations? That's right. And it is defined, actually. I can, uh, I can define that. So you see, if I take category O, usual, let's say for the final dimension, the same is simple the algebra, then on category O, there is a involution. And what it does is basically the same thing. So in category O, any module is, has very specific condition. Or at least the the the, the uh, whatever uh, the large I mean uh, generalized beta space decomposition. So you take the direct sum of that, and now you apply the Chevalier evolution on G. So which switches the positive root vectors to the negative root vectors. So that 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 does the same thing. So so there is a, a involution on category O, and I'm doing exactly the same thing, but little bit different. So what I'm doing, I am not say I am I am keeping this thing on the finite part. I am only switching on the on the T direction, you know, because this action, I mean if I were to do it in category O, what I would have done here, I would have done not just this one, but even this one by the Chevalier involution. So whatever uh, so I would have done this one where is the Chevalier in evolution of G. Now that's an evolution of the category O, which is very I mean, uh, useful. But uh, in terms of the interpretation in, uh, in a more functorial term, I will have to think about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. If you take uh, it from the zero, and eight uh, lambda star at infinity. Yes. What is the space of uh, Kovacuba? Ah, okay, okay. So it's one dimensional. Yes. It's one dimensional. It is one dimensional. That's right. That's right. So it's kind of dual. It's yes, right. exactly. That's right. That's right. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. Yes. So so the result is that if I take D and we take P1, for example. And if I take lambda, lambda star zero on any of the three points, this is space is one dimension. Well, that sounds like the answer is yes. Or if, or, or what? Yes, that's right. Yes. Yes. yes, correct, 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 correct. Exactly, exactly. I mean, but maybe as you said, maybe there is a more, even more general 
beyond the integrable model of the uh, uh, operation, which I don't know, I mean, uh, a priori at least. But this result is, it's one dimensional. But if I take V on P1, and I take lambda, and I take, let's say, mu, and mu is different from lambda star, then it is G. Then this is basic G. Okay, so let's see, I have 10 minutes. So, okay, so I am going to state the factorization theorem, uh, but I am afraid I will not be able to give the idea of the proof today. But in any case, let's get started as to what this uh, uh, statement is, and we will start to prove it next time. So. So the setting is again, so sigma p is a S-pointed curve. And I have one point q here in sigma, which is a node. And there may be other nodes, I don't care. I just take one particular node there, q. And of course, q cannot be p because these are smooth points and it's a node. Now I take the normalization of this at Q only. So just normalization at Q. At Q. Okay, so now, so this point, let's say Q here, and that breaks up into two points, Q prime and Q double prime. And, and now we have a map from sigma twiddle minus p and q prime q double prime to sigma minus p. I mean, of course, I mean, it also avoids q, but I just need this map. Okay, so let's just call this map pi. Actually, pi is this map. I am still going to call it pi. And pi star becomes a map in the opposite direction, g of sigma minus p to g of sigma twiddle minus p q prime q double prime. Okay, now this is a Lee algebra homomorphism clearly under the usual uh, 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 point wise bracket. Okay. So, so I'm going to define a map from H lambda. H lambda tensor D of H mu tensor H mu and actually sorry and I'm going to take mu all the weights in DC. Okay. Now as I say D of H mu is nothing but H of mu star. So this map is H going to H tensor and mu I mu. And what is I mu? So D of H mu has D of mu star here and H mu has 
degree of mu inside here as the highest, highest piece. And this one has this as the highest piece. And now I'm going to take tensor product of that. And this is there's the identity element here in view mu star v mu. So this, of course, is same as n. And I take the identity element, which is the unique element, which is G module map. So I take that. Right. So now this map, let's call it, I'm going to call it this map F height. So F hat is a G hat, no, sorry, sorry, not G, sorry, G sigma minus P module hat. So here, of course, we have the G of sigma minus P structure here. And here, I take the structure coming from here. So this is naturally, Ah, so I am putting this at P and this I'm putting at Q prime and this I'm putting at Q prime. Right. And at this point, Q prime and Q double prime, I will choose a local parameter Z prime and Z double prime. That's the local parameter. So this F, capital F hat, sorry. Capital F hat, is a G of sigma minus P module map. It's acting here and here, this thing is acting, but then I go over at this one. So that uh, makes it a G module map, G sigma minus P module map. In particular, I get a map from V of sigma P lambda to V of sigma twiddle and P and Q prime and Q double prime. And for lambda, I am going to put mu star and mu. And mu runs over DC. So, so this F hat gives rise to this map because I'm taking co-invariant here with respect to the G sigma minus P. And here I am taking with it larger the algebra. So of course this will this will give me a map from here to here. And theorem is <laughs> the above map is an answer map. So that's the factorization theorem. The importance of this is probably obvious to you that this was a genus G curve and this dimension calculation from a genus G curve goes to a G minus one curve because this is a G, genus G minus one, except that now you have to deal with extra points. So, so this map being uh, yeah? of representations, what, yeah. what goes into that? No, sorry, so I said again. Like, ah, oh, okay, okay. You're acting on the second tensor. Absolutely, <laughs> good, good that you asked me this. This is because I mu is uh, a G mod, uh, I mean, is inhalated by the G action. The finite dimensional. Yes, finite dimensional, G, G, G action, that's right. So that goes into the thing because you see, that's right. So that's right. So uh, see, because you never hit Q here. See, in this thing, Q is not being hit. So that means that that the function here does not have a pole at Q. So it's well defined at Q. So when you are going to act that here. It's only going to, and the positive power of that is going to kill it. And not only positive power, 
But even the Lie algebra G, the finite dimensional Lie algebra is going to kill it. So, so this becomes, so see, this becomes G of sigma minus. Second, if you take an element of G sigma minus, but the two point group are meant to second, you get the same element of the Lie algebra. But I, I'm confused about what's going on at the level of the finite dimension. So that each of these things has a highest weight. Well, sorry. But just the, the highest weight vector, not, not a finite. Think of it as, as No, no, no. It's not the highest weight vector. No, no, no. See, this is the identity map we knew. So this is the, the unique G module map, finite G module map. Ah. That's very important. No, no, the highest weight vector will not do it. Uh, wait, yeah, correct, correct. No, let's be clear here. Okay. So here, I am taking the identity element here. I'm just calling it the new identity element here. So in wait, terms sorry. of the dual, there is a unique element in the, a natural element in the, in the, the real yeah. So V mu here yeah. means, means some enormous thing, right? Correct, absolutely. No, no. So, V mu is finite dimensional. No, it's enormous, but finite dimensional. Oh, sorry, then I'm confused. What, what is V mu? This V mu is the irreducible module for G, not for G height. Uh -huh. V mu is the, my earlier V mu. Uh -huh. I'm not changing the notation. G is not for verbal module. No, it's no, 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 I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. V mu is irreducible G module, uh, uh, finite dimensional irreducible G module with highest weight. No, no mu. This is what it is. So this duality operation D is rigged so that it converts. So, so it's killed by G. This element is inhalated by G. Uh -huh. Okay, I think I get it now. Right? So, so first of all, it's inhalated by G. And also, it's, see, because, so, so as you said, Q is not here. So when I'm going to take the power series expansion at Q, I'm only going to get either G, the finite G, or positive powers. Now, positive powers are going to be killed because I'm taking the highest space here. And G is also going to kill because it's an invariant. So, 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 so <laughs> that you, you asked, so, so to clarify, this is very important. Both of these things are very important that I'm taking in the highest weight piece and I'm taking it a G invariant. So this becomes a well-defined G of sigma minus P module map. In particular, it will descend to a map like this. And once it descends, then the question is whether this is an isomorphic. And the theorem says yes. Does it make sense? Good. But yeah. this um, you, if I take again a protective line, uh, it's yeah. mu and zero and yeah, exactly. infinite. Then this one will map to the generator of the yeah, yes, that's, I think so. I think so. That's right. That's, indeed, indeed. Indeed, it will do that. Yes, yes. Yeah, I'm pretty certain it will do that. Yes. Okay, so I guess I stop here today. <laughs> I am even over time and I did not give any break. So. <laughs> No, we have five minutes to have this question. <laughs> <laughs> so we meet next Thursday, and I will fix this. And I have a bunch of cohomology questions which I will try to sort out exactly what I sent you and so on. So, so yeah, I, and I, I sent everybody in the phone.